Gaia was hit by a micrometeorite and a solar storm, mapping a lunar lava tube from space. Both Mars rovers found fascinating rocks and a direct image of the closest exo Jupiter. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Now you know that I love the Gaia mission and I don't want anything to happen to it. And yet, you know, we've got to let our babies go out into space to explore the universe. And that comes with risks. Sometimes they're going to fall down and they're going to skin their knee. And sometimes they're going to get hit by a micrometeorite moving at tens of kilometers per second and one of the biggest solar storms on record. And so Issa's Gaia mission got hit by two potential calamities earlier this year. In April, astronomers noticed that the images that Gaia was taking weren't as nice as they were supposed to be. And when they did a bunch of research into the problem, they realized that a micrometeorite had slammed into Gaia and just hit in exactly the wrong place where it hit a protective cover that's designed to stop stray light from getting into the instruments. And so light was coming into the cameras that should have been blocked by the sides of this protective cover. And then while while they were working on troubleshooting this problem, that giant solar storm that hit Earth back in May. Like you remember how we all saw the auroras? Well, except for me, but everybody else saw the auroras that also hit satellites and various spacecraft. And so there's a bunch of electrical issues that were hitting the spacecraft at the same time. Well, good news. Engineers worked through the problems and minimized their impact. And in fact, while they were working with the spacecraft, they were able to improve its focusing system. And so this gave them time to make the telescope even better. And so now we are just waiting for that sweet, sweet data release five coming soon. Mapping a lava tube from space. I've talked a lot about how lava tubes on the moon and Mars are the perfect ways for us to both explore the interiors of these worlds, but also be protected by the harsh conditions of space. Even though on the surface of the moon, for example, you're experiencing just incredible cosmic radiation, about 200 times more radiation hits you when you're on the surface of the moon than when you are down here on the surface of Earth. And so if you can get below the regolith in some way in a cave, then you can be protected from that radiation. And so we know of dozens, if not hundreds of lava tubes on the moon and Mars seen from space. There are these skylights, these collapsed entrances where the roof of one of these lava tubes has caved in. And theoretically, there's like a big chasm underneath that extends for kilometers in both directions. Well, now researchers have taken data from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and mapped the entrance to one of these lava tubes. They used radar data to map one of these caves located in Mare Tranquillus, which is actually really close to the Apollo 11 landing site. They found that the cave is about 45 meters wide and 80 meters long and the bottom of the cave is about 150 meters below the surface of the moon. And so this gives a lot more proof that these holes that we see on the surface of the moon and Mars are indeed lava tubes. And so the next thing is to explore them. Both curiosity and perseverance found really interesting rocks. So in May, NASA's Curiosity rover was rolling across the surface of Mars in a region called Geddes Valles when it drove over a random rock and cracked it open. And then when researchers at NASA looked at the rock, they saw this really bright yellow crystal. Turns out this is elemental sulfur. Now sulfur isn't a big surprise. In fact, this region was chosen for Curiosity to move to next because there's a lot of sulfate chemicals mixed in with the rocks. And this is an indication that there was water acting for a long time in this region. But this rock is pure elemental sulfur, and you need special conditions to produce that you need volcanism. And so now the idea is that you have like volcanism directly under this region that was producing sulfur, it was coming to the surface, and then the whole area was swept by water. And that produced all of these sulfate salts in the area. And it, what I love is once they realized that this rock they cracked open was filled with these sulfur crystals, they saw more of these rocks all around the rover. And so you can imagine if it just starts crunching more of these rocks, they'll find more of this sulfur. I wouldn't be surprised if Curiosity stays here for a long time. Now, not to be outdone, the Perseverance rover found a really cool rock of its own. 
probably more important. And so just remember, Perseverance is in a region on Mars called Jezero Crater. And this is sort of one of the most intriguing places on Mars, because it's the sort of ancient crater. And there's all of the indications that water was flowing in and out of this crater a long time ago, that it was probably filled with water like a lake at one time. And so Perseverance is in a region called Noretva Valis. And this appears to be like an ancient river that was flowing water into Jezero Crater. Found this really interesting rock flush to the bottom of this river channel that has veins of white material, as well as these really weird black spots. And so upon further analysis, researchers were able to tell that the white material is calcium sulfate. And then there's darker, redder regions of hematite, which is an iron rich mineral. And then they found little black spots that contain iron and phosphate. And that's really interesting. Because here on Earth, we get that similar condition when you have bacteria in rock that is consuming the iron as fuel and producing various byproducts. But of course, there are inorganic ways that you can get the similar kinds of rocks here on Earth as well. And so presumably still on Mars. So you know, as always, be skeptical. But very interesting discovery made by Perseverance. And you can see where they drilled a core sample from this rock. And so this is one of the samples that could be returned to Earth on the Mars sample return mission, if it ever happens. Can you imagine if researchers on Earth could get their hands on that sample and study it in the world's greatest labs? Another direct image of an exoplanet. The closest Jupiter like planet to the solar system that we know of is called Epsilon Indy AB. And this is like a staple in science fiction. The star is only 12 light years away. And so people have imagined all kinds of things in this system. And we've known about this planet in the system for quite a while. It was discovered using the radial velocity methods. So that's where you measure the change in velocity of the star because of the gravity of the planet that is orbiting around it. It has several times the mass of Jupiter, but it's one of the coldest exoplanets that's ever been discovered. It's only two degrees Celsius. If that sounds cold to you, keep in mind that the gas giants in the solar system are like minus 100 Celsius. And now the James Webb Space Telescope has been able to take direct images of this planet orbiting around. And this is great because you can see how they're blocking the light from the star so that they can see the fainter exoplanet that is orbiting around it. And this is the kind of work that we're going to see being done by the Roman Space Telescope when it launches in a couple of years from now, it's going to be able to make these kinds of observations, be able to detect more like Jupiter sized worlds orbiting around even sun like stars. Now they were only able to do a little bit of spectroscopic analysis on this planet, not enough to really pick out all of the chemicals in the atmosphere of the planet. But it indicates that it probably has high levels of methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But I'm sure we're going to see more analysis from Webb of this planet in the future and really draw out that light to figure out what's going on in the atmosphere of this world. ESA is sending a mission to Apophis. So for the longest time, the most dangerous asteroid that we knew of was called 99942 Apophis. And this space rock is due to make a flyby of Earth in April 2029. The estimations were that this asteroid was going to make a flyby of Earth It would come within 32,000 kilometers of our planet, which is below geostationary satellites. And then it would receive a gravitational tweak to its orbit. And then in a future flyby a couple of years later, it could actually crash into the Earth. Well, tons and tons of observations have been made from Apophis. And now it's been completely ruled out. There's now no threat from Apophis in like for centuries. But it's an incredibly fascinating target because it's going to come so close to Earth, it's going to be warped and flexed by its interaction with the Earth's gravity as it completes this flyby. Now that the Osiris Rex mission has returned its samples to Earth, NASA has sent it on to its future target, which is going to be asteroid Apophis. But the problem is it's going to arrive at Apophis a month after the flyby. And so astronomers would really like to watch as this flyby is happening, measure the asteroid before and after the flyby of Earth. And so the European Space Agency has decided that they're going to tackle that scientific question, they're going to launch a mission that will rendezvous with Apophis in February 2029, and then be in orbit around the asteroid 
as it flies past Earth in April. So they've got to launch this mission by 2028 to make this happen. They got to design it, build it, launch it, and have it arrive in time for that flyby. And what I really love about this Apophis flyby in 2029 is that you're going to be able to see it about 2 billion human beings will be able to watch the flyby happen. There'll be this bright star that just moves across the sky as the asteroid is coming that close to Earth. Scary, but cool. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the biggest news of the week. And this week, the winning vote was that NASA has canceled the Viper Rover. So thank you everybody who took the time to vote. Now we will post the new vote on the channel within 24 hours of when we post this episode of Space Bites. You can see it in the community tab. If you're just scrolling on your phone, you should be able to see the vote come up. Take a second, vote. Tell us what you thought was the best story. Now the best chance to see the vote is to be subscribed to the channel, to click on the notifications bell, and then train the algorithm that you like to watch our videos, and then you'll see the vote. Mercury has a huge layer of diamonds inside. One of the interesting discoveries made by NASA's messenger mission when it visited Mercury several years ago is that there is large amounts of carbon on the surface of Mercury. In fact, it detected the presence of graphene, which is pencil lead. This carbon has to be coming from somewhere. And so astronomers think that there's like a rich source of carbon inside Mercury that has come to the surface through volcanic eruptions. And now a researcher is proposing that if you sort of consider the amount of carbon that's made its way to the surface, then if you go deeper down into Mercury, it probably has a layer of carbon about 18 kilometers thick. And because of the intense pressure and high temperatures, you're going to get this carbon crushed down and turned into diamonds. And so if you want to make a lot of money, all you have to do is fly to Mercury, drill down below the surface and harvest those sweet, sweet diamonds, and then bring them back to Earth. You know, as always, there could be a pile of diamonds sitting on the surface of Mercury, and it would be too expensive to go and grab them, bring them home pile, just like a nice neat pile up a, a, a lunchbox filled with diamonds, and it would be too expensive to go and get that lunchbox. New Horizons measures the cosmic optical background light. You're probably familiar with the cosmic microwave background radiation. This was the first light in the universe when things cooled down so that it was no longer opaque. But there are other backgrounds to the universe. There is the gravitational wave background. There is the neutrino background. And there is also the optical background, essentially just visible light that is coming from all directions towards Earth. Now, one big explanation for the optical background is that you are seeing reflected light off of all of the dust in the solar system. And we see that there's this thing called zodiacal light that if you go you point your telescope at night, you see these strange dust plumes in the sky. And this is small bits of dust in the solar system that are reflecting light from the sun. But astronomers have always wondered, is there something else beyond just all of the stars and galaxies in the universe? So they need a way to be able to get outside the solar system away from all of the dust to be able to see a more pure version of the visible light in the universe. And thankfully, we've got the New Horizon spacecraft and it has a fairly big telescope. And so it was able to do some imaging of the universe itself, trying to detect the presence of the optical background. And what they found is that in fact, the optical background is only coming from all of the galaxies in the observable universe and not something in between the galaxies. You can imagine like, what if there was like tons and tons of stars all in between the various galaxies in the universe, and that would be contributing enough light? Or what if there was just glowing gas in between galaxies, and that would be contributing this optical light, but it turns out, no, it is concentrated into all of the different galaxies in the universe. While you're watching this episode of Space Bites, I am writing my weekly email newsletter, which has a ton more stories than we have time to cover here on Space Bites. For example, the shelf life of most medications is shorter than a round trip to Mars. Astronomers have tools that allow them to detect deep fake images. And what would be possible with a next generation event horizon telescope? So this is just a few examples of the stories that we're working on on Universe Today, and I put them all into my weekly email newsletter. You can sign up. It's completely free. 70,000 people read it every week. 
unsubscribe anytime you like. There's no advertisements. I write every word. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. I always like to end these episodes with really cool images and videos. So first, it is the 25th anniversary of the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And so to celebrate, researchers released 25 images from Chandra that have never been seen before. Extremely energetic events release X-rays. And so you've got things like active supermassive black holes, accretion disks, pulsars, neutron stars, regions of hot gas, even auroras on planets, and this really cool set of images. And so now you've got 25 new images that you've never seen before taken by Chandra and other telescopes merged together for your new wallpaper. So now here's 25 more wallpapers. You need 25 more walls. And don't forget that NASA is planning on shutting down this observatory because of budget issues. That's it. No follow on instrument. The spacecraft is fine. Just not enough money to keep running it. That is all. And then check out this amazing video of worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. So this video was made based on data taken from space between January and March 2020. And so you're seeing winter in the northern hemisphere, summer in the southern hemisphere, and you can see all the carbon dioxide emissions coming from North America from Europe from Asia. And then in the southern hemisphere, you can see there's fires as well as carbon dioxide emissions, and they're being reabsorbed by plants as they're growing. So it's both amazing and mesmerizing. And of course, you know, a little unnerving to see all that carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. I'm going to talk about a few projects that we're working on. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Bill, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Monzo, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fallon Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. We just crossed the second anniversary of the James Webb Space Telescope, and to celebrate, once again, we did our entire year in review of images from the James Webb Space Telescope. This is all of the really cool, big new research, all of the amazing pictures. It's like almost an hour long, great graphics. Anton really put in a lot of work into this video, and we're really proud of it. I really like the way that we structured the video. We sort of started with objects that are very close to us and then sort of move through the galaxy and eventually out to cosmic scales. And so I think, you know, it's one of the videos that I'm the proudest of so far this year. And so if you like saw it and you weren't sure, I think you'll really enjoy it. All right. We'll see you next week.